An Inhabitant of Carcosa by Ambrose Bierce. For there be divers sorts of death, somewhere in the body remneth, and some it vanisheth quite away with the spirit. It commonly occurreth only in solitude, such as God's will, and, none seeing the end, we say the man is lost, or gone on a long journey, which indeed he hath, but sometimes it hath happened in sight of many, as abundant testimony showeth. In one kind of death the spirit also dieth, and this it hath been known to do well, yet the body was in vigor for many years. Sometimes, as it is veritably attested, it dieth with the body, but after a season is raised up again, in that place where the body did decay. Pondering these words of Halley, whom God rest, and questioning their full meaning, as one who, having an intimation, yet doubts if there be not something behind, other than that which he has discerned, I noted not whither I strayed, until a sudden chill wind striking my face revived in me a sense of my surroundings. I observed with astonishment that everything seemed unfamiliar. On every side of me stretched a bleak and desolate expanse of plain, covered with a tall overgrowth of sear grass, which rustled and whistled in the autumn wind, with heaven knows what mysterious and disquieting suggestion. Protruded at long intervals above it stood strangely shaped and somber colored rocks, which seemed to have an understanding with one another, and to exchange looks of uncomfortable significance, as if they reared their heads to watch the issue of some foreseen event. A few blasted trees here and there appeared in, as leaders in this malevolent conspiracy of silent expectation. The day, I thought, must be far advanced, though the sun was invisible, and although sensible that the air was raw and chill, my consciousness of the fact was rather mental than physical. I had no feeling of discomfort. Over all the dismal landscape a canopy of low, lead-colored clouds hung like a visible curse. In all this there was a menace and a portent, a hint of evil, an intimation of doom. Bird, beast, or insect, there was none. The wind sighed in the bare branches of dead trees, and the gray grass bent to whisper its dread secret to the earth, but no other sound nor motion broke the awful repose of that dismal place. I observed in the herbage a number of weather-worn stones, evidently shaped with tools. They were broken, covered with moss and half sunken in the earth. Some lay prostrate, some leaned at various angles, none was vertical. They were obviously headstones of graves, though the graves themselves no longer existed, as either mounds or depressions. The years had leveled all. Scattered here and there, more massive blocks showed where some pompous tomb or ambitious monument had once flung its feeble at defiance at oblivion. So old seem these relics, these vestiges of vanity and memorials of affection and piety, so battered and worn and stained, so neglected, deserted, forgotten the place that I could not help thinking myself the discoverer of the burial ground of a prehistoric race of men whose very name was long extinct. Filled with these reflections, I was for some time heedless of the sequence of my own experiences, but soon I thought, how came I hither? A moment's reflection seemed to make this all clear, and explain at the same time, though in a disquiet way, the singular character with which my fancy had invested all that I saw or heard. I was ill. I remember that I had been prostrated by a sudden fever, and that my family had told me that in my periods of delirium I had constantly cried out for liberty and air, and had been held in bed to prevent my escape out of doors. Now I had eluded the vigilance of my attendants, and had wandered hitherto to where I could not conjecture. Clearly I was at a considerable distance from the city where I dwelt, the ancient and famous city of Carcosa. No signs of human life were anywhere visible, nor audible. No rising smoke, no watchdog's bark, no lowing of cattle, no shoots of children at play. Nothing but that dismal burial place, with its air of mystery and dread, due to my own disordered brain. Was I not becoming again delirious, there beyond human aid? Was it not indeed all an illusion of my madness? I called aloud the names of my wives and sons, reached out my hands in search of theirs even as I walked among the crumbling stones in the withered grass. A noise behind me caused me to turn about. A wild animal, a lynx, was approaching. The thought came to me, if I break down here in the desert, if my fever return and I fail, this beast will be at my throat. I sprang towards it, shouting. It trotted tranquilly by, within a hand's breadth of me, and disappeared behind a rock. A moment later a man's head appeared to rise out of the ground, a short distance away. 
He was ascending the farther slope of the low hill, whose crest was hardly to be distinguished from the general level. His whole figure soon came into view against the background of the grey cloud. He was half naked, half clad in skins. His hair was unkempt, his beard long and ragged. In one hand he carried a bow and arrow, in the other a blazing torch with a long trail of black smoke. He walked slowly, and with caution, as if he feared falling into some open grave concealed by the tall grass. This strange apparition surprised, but did not alarm, and taking such a course to, as to intercept him, I met him almost face to face, accosting him with the familiar salutation, God keep you. He gave no heed, nor did he arrest his pace. Good stranger, I continued, I am ill and lost, direct me, I beseech you, to Carcosa. The man broke into a barbarous chant, in an unknown tongue, passing on and away. An owl on the branch of a decayed tree hooted dismally, and was answered by another in the distance. Looking upward I saw through a sudden rift in the clouds, Aldebaran and the Hyades, in all this there was a hint of night, the lynx, the man with the torch, the owl, yet I saw, I saw even the stars in absence of the darkness, I saw but was apparently not seen nor heard, under what awful spell did I exist? I seated myself at the root of a great tree, seriously to consider what were best to do, that I was mad I could no longer doubt, yet recognized a ground of doubt in the conviction. Of fever I had no trace. I had, with all, a sense of exhilaration and vigor altogether unknown to me, a feeling of mental and physical exaltation. My senses seemed all alert. I could feel the air as a ponderous substance. I could hear the silence. A great root of the giant tree against whose trunk I had leaned, as I sat held enclosed in its grasp a slab of stone, a part of which protruded into recesses formed by another root. The stone was thus partly protected from the weather, though greatly decomposed. Its edges were worn round, its corners eaten away, its surface deeply furrowed and scaled. Glittering particles of mica were visible in the earth around it, vestiges of its decomposition. The stone had apparently marked the grave out of which the tree had sprung ages ago. The tree's exacting roots had robbed the grave and made the stone a prisoner. A sudden wind pushed some dry leaves and twigs from the uppermost face of the stone. I saw the low relief letters of an inscription and bent to read it. God in heaven, my name in full, the date of my birth, the date of my death. A level shaft of light illuminated the whole side of the tree as I sprung to my feet in terror. The sun was rising in the rosy east. I stood between the tree and his broad red disc. No shadow darkened the trunk. A chorus of howling wolves saluted the dawn. I saw them sitting on their haunches, singly and in groups on the summit of the irregular mounds, and tumuli filling in half of my desert prospect, and extending to the horizon. And then I knew that these were the ruins of the ancient and famous city of Carcosa. Such are the facts imparted to the medium Bayrolis by the spirit Hoseib Elar Roberidin. But it's not! Where can I find this podcast? And how many doubloons will that cost me? It's free! like my soul! You boy, what day is it today? It's Canada Day, it seems. Well, go buy that biggest Christmas goose in the window. That makes no sense. I'm just taking your money and leaving. Finlandoldtimeradio.podbean.com